In this last session, we will talk about how to use Spark on our HPC. Spark has quite a standard program life cycle. The first step in Spark is basically to create data frames, either from external data or from a collection already in the driver program. And you can refer to the API by click this link. And then we will lazily transform the data frames into new data frames. Okay, so the transforms, um, for example, we see in the log mining example, um, map, filter, they are all transforms, right? So they are all lazy transforms. And uh, the next thing is that we should use cache. We should use cache for data frames that will be reused, that will be reused more than once, right? So if the data frames will be used more than once, we should use cache for it. This can speed up the task, right? So this can speed up the task. And then the next step is to perform actions, right? So actions will execute the parallel computation and uh, produce the results to generate from the workers and pass back to the drivers. And uh, I want to uh, remind you that you should use Spark transformations and uh, actions as much as possible and wherever possible. Right? So therefore you need to search and uh, get familiar with data frame reference API. You can click it. And uh, you should uh, use it for most of the tasks, if not all, right? So, but for us, for our beginning, right? So you should use transformations and actions for almost all of your tasks, right? So um, Spark is very mature. So most of the tasks, if not all, should be completed with Spark APIs, right? With transformations and actions. We will work on PySpark 3.01 released in September last year. And to run PySpark, we need Java because Pi, because Spark is written in Scala and Scala is Java based. Right? So then we also need Python for PySpark and also Spark for PySpark. And uh, we will do our lab and uh, all of our assessments on HPC. Right? So therefore you please see the lab for how to install it on our HPC. And uh, if you are interested, you can also install on your own machine, but this is uh, uh, optional. And for Windows, you can refer to the lab one instructions. You need to install Java GRE, Java running environment, Python and Spark. You can also try pip install PySpark, but I, I didn't because I already installed that, uh, install PySpark using the instructions, but you can try, right? So on HPC, we use pip install, right? So PySpark after Conda environment. And uh, you can also install PySpark on Linux and Mac, and we provide some references um, in the lab, right? So, but uh, I don't have Mac, so I didn't try to try it out. And, uh, mm, but we will do our lab and uh, assessment on the HPC, right? So the HPC is called Shark HPC. The full name is Sheffield Advanced research computer, right? So this is the actual picture of the shock system of our university. As you can click the link to see the page. And uh, to use the HPC, you must connect to the VPN first, right? So unless you are on campus network, that means unless you are, for example, in university accommodation where you have the internet, right? You have the internet, that means a campus network. Otherwise, you need to connect to your VPN first, right? So the VPN will basically connect you to campus network. Then you can 
connect to HPC through SSH. Right? So the host name is shark.sheffield.ac.uk. It's very easy to remember name, but don't spell it wrongly as S-H-A-R-K, right? so this A-R-C. On Windows, I will recommend you to use mobile XRM. That's what I use. And on Linux and Mac, um, I think you can use terminal, right? So you just type SSH, your username at Sheffield, and then you will get, uh, add Shark and you will get in. And for HPC related issues, um, please email HPC at Sheffield.ac.uk, right? So for the lab procedures, you can come to me, but if you have any um, HPC errors, then you should, if it's not programming error, but HPC errors, please go to um, this email address for help. So HPC works quite differently from um, working with local machines, right? like our computers, our personal computers. When you do SSH and login, you will come to the login node, right? You come to the login node, and then you will request a resource, right? You will request some resources, and a node will be allocated to you, right? So, and then that node will access your, the storage, right? Your personal data and uh, code, right? So these are, the storage are all shared and the nodes are all shared, right? So these are all shared resources. And uh, you need to understand the storage where the most importantly is home slash user, right? So that's when you log in, you are at this location, right? You are at home slash your username. This space is shared and it has a quota of 10 gigabytes and is regularly backed up and have standard speed. And it's good for your personal um, data. For example, your code, um, your assignments, right? You can put uh, under this, um, uh, on, but basically for the home, right? For home user, you should try to uh, keep your Honda installation over there, right? So for, there's another directory called data slash data, uh, data slash user. It is also shared for all the nodes and you have a larger quota of 100 gigabytes, right? You should store your big data under this directory, right? So of uh, slash data, your username, right? For big data, for example, if it's one gigabyte, you should really store in this directory, right? So, so it's also regularly backed up at regular speed, and it's for you, for you to store your personal pro program data, right? Not your personal private data, but a program like assignment data over there. Another directory is called slash fast data slash user. It's also shared among the nodes. And in theory, there's a limit, but uh, because it's um, very large, so you can consider it as no limit, right? So by, there's no backup. So if there's any server error, it will be gone. So don't store your important data over there. It's, uh, it's very fast. It's suitable for you to store temporary data, right? Temporary data, like immediate data or whatsoever. Um, and there's another directory called Scratch. It's not shared. Therefore, it's local to the node. No backup, very fast. It's good for you to store temporary, temporary small files, right? Small files. Just remember, most of the storage um, are shared, right? Shared among nodes. So you can work on HPC through um, two modes. One is interactive session, where, for example, when you set, set things up, you type PySpark, then you will see a splash, like the following, Spark version 3.0.1, with your Python version displayed. And because you are using PySpark shell, so a Spark session will be available as Spark, right? So automatically, you don't need to import, right? You don't need to import, it's already available. And you can also um, run Spark in a batch session, right? So by creating a shell script, right? Something dot shell. Um, and uh, we include one example in lab one. And uh, for example, 
um, the first line is standard, and uh, the second line specify how much time, right? So you are request you are requesting. The maximum is four days, four times twenty four. That is uh, ninety six, right? So ninety six hours. The largest number you can put here is ninety six. If you put a larger number then you will never get it, right? Because you can you can allocate at, at most four days, right? So therefore, um, remember no more than 96 over here. And this number of course, uh, similar, right? If you, um, it's okay to request two, four, eight, 12, right? So 18, um, 32, but if it's too large, you will, it will take a long time or you will never get it, right? So if you get put it like a hundred or 200 or 400, right? So, um, it will be difficult, right? So because it's shared, and uh, this memory, right? So similarly, right? So don't request too much, right? So so this specifies the output file where is the running out um, the the output of the the um, code, right? So it will be um, stored in this text file over here, and this should be standard. And I will recommend you to install that into one file. And you can specify your personal email address. You can specify your personal email address over here so that you will receive notification by this setting, right? You can check the help from our HPC to see the other options, but here, EA option, when you specify EA option, you will receive an email when your job has finished, right? Has finished or aborted. For example, if there's an error, right? So you will receive and email, right? So by specify this setting. And CWD means running from the current di directory. Therefore, you need to CD into the directory. So these are some of your scripts that you need to run, right? So um, when we use the batch session, you can submit your job and uh, relax, right? So basically, you do a queue sub to your, uh, for your job. And this queue sub can be run at the login node, right? So please see lab one. And then after that, basically you can close your terminal, you can cross it, you can close the terminal, you can close your computer and leave, right? So because it's queued over there and uh, it will be uh, running when it's uh, allocated the resources, right? So, and then you can wait for the preset email notification when it's finished, or if there's an error, you will receive an e email. And if you um, want to check um, before receiving an email, you can also check your status by logging and type Q st status, right? So Q status. And if you want to queue a job, for example, you think, oh, it's too long, right? So after one or two days, it's still running. Must, something must be wrong, right? So, or, or you see uh, the intermediate results when you can open the output file, right? So the output file is constantly updated. If you write some intermediate output, you can observe it, see, oh, something is wrong, right? So then you can delete your uh, job by Q delete, right? So please delete your job because it's taking up resources. And uh, you may have a question, how much resources should I request? How many calls, how many memories, right? So there's no standard answer, but uh, our, the standard, our professional uh, recommendation from our IIC team, our research uh, software engineer team is that you should Firstly, run some short test job, right? So run some short test job and you view the resource utilization, for example, by requesting um, a, a, a decent amount of resources to see whether it can, how much time it will finish, right? So then it will give you some idea and then you can try to estimate, right? Try to extrapolate and then submit larger jobs. I don't submit large jobs before you try to run some test jobs, right? So some small jobs that can give you an idea of how, mu how much time it will take and how many resources it will need. And then because Spark is open source, so you can find many open resources, right? So firstly, the first thing you need to uh, consult is of course the Spark documentation. There's also a very good um, tutorial, but it was uh, uh, updated like one year ago, right? So it's not uh, updated after that. You can also watch many Spark videos on YouTube, and you can also um, take a look at the source code for uh, of Spark. And uh, uh, in the lab, right? So there's also some uh, some suggested readings, right? You can please click and uh, at least you click and take a look what it is, right? So when you need it. 
you know where to find it, right? So when you um, take a look at the online documentations, you should choose Python rather than um, choose Scala, right? So because we use PySpark. And uh, finally, um, I want to acknowledge that some of the slides, um, especially in the uh, section one, has been uh, is basically adapted from a Berkeley UC Berkeley uh, course called the Introduction to Apache Spark, right? So by Professor uh, Joseph, right? So also we have benefit uh, we have uh, benefited from many open resources, and uh, we try to acknowledge uh, as uh, we can. Uh, as much as we can on the GitHub page. And uh, there are also many other resources that uh, I may have consulted, but uh, somehow lose track. Right? So um, here I, I would like to thank those open resources um, and the many students, right? So uh, like you, uh, they also contributed to the development of our module. Right? So um, I should thank them uh, and thank you as well. Right? So that come to the end of our first lecture on um, Spark and scalable machine learning, right? So um, in the next lecture, in the next uh, video, I will go through the lab, okay? That's